And it's become their sort of signature thing. So they always do it that way. I'm not asking you to do that, David, but you know, it's, but we have that because it's so familiar to us. So it, it's been lovely to have this time of allowing it to breathe. And it's great to have David with us today, who's going to be preaching. Um, so thank you ever so much for being here. And you've got Howard in front. You've got sort of three of us for the price of one today. It's getting better and better, isn't it? After we've shared um, these weeks, we're going to continue with prayer for the next few weeks because um, we're going to, prayer is at the very heart of discipleship. And um, it, it's, it's, it, you can't really be somebody who's trying to grow in your discipleship if, it, if there's not a basis of prayer underpinning it all. Um, however short, however long, however complex, however simple you feel your prayer life is, um, try not to judge it, just try and let it be. And um, that's what's great about worship, is we, it gives us a time just to be with God this morning as we worship him together. Um, we haven't, uh, uh, unfortunately, we haven't got Liz with us today, um, but we are, and so we're going to be using um, some hymns and songs that will be both through the, the, the sound system, but the music group are very kindly here, and they'll be sharing with us as well. One very last thing before we begin, um, just to say, for both people who are joining us online and people who are here this morning, some of you will know a, a lovely lady over in Kongsbury called Pearl Salmon. Um, so Pearl is an absolute legend, um, one of those wonderful faithful servants of Christ over all her life, and um, she passed away during this week. So our thoughts and our prayers are very much with her family, and they may well be joining us online this morning. So we send all our love to them. We begin by lighting our candles that we have faithfully each week, reminding us that we are not just the group of people here in this physical church here in Banwell, but we're joined by brothers and sisters online. We're joined by people in many different churches around the world, those we know and have links with, those that may be known to each one of you. And so we become a family wherever we are. And if you've got a candle at home, now is a really good time to light it. So let us share in our opening prayer together as we share this old prayer of Richard of Chichester. We pray together. Thanks be to you, my Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits you have given me, for all the pains and insults you have borne for me. O most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. And the next one, please, Kirsty. Thank you. Thank you, George. Throughout this time, for many people, they say, well, somebody actually said to me this week, Afghanistan is now done. And that, that really, it made me quite shocked, actually, to think Afghanistan, in some people's minds, you know, the way the media works and everything like that. And um, any of you who heard uh, Tobias Elwood do his interview the other day, who's the, somebody who served in Afghanistan and has become quite a, a, a voice for, for the Afghan people, in our country, um, he would say it's far from done. It's about praying for them, walking with them, trying to support them as a community in their country and also those who are looking to make their home in this country and elsewhere around the world. And this is a, an old prayer which has come from the um, Christian aid community who, from the part of the world that covers Afghanistan and will continue to try and work in very difficult circumstances in that part of the world. I don't know whether you can see the words fully, but I'll, I'll read them and, and we'll pray them together. And if you can see them and you'd like to join in, please do so. So let us pray for Afghanistan today. O oh God of mercy and of peace, we hold before you the people of Afghanistan. Be living bread to those who are hungry each day. Bring healing to those who have no access to health care or medicines. Be the true home to all who are displaced. 
be the open arms of loving acceptance to those who live in fear because of their gender, ethnicity, religious or political views. Open our eyes to see you in all acts of compassionate care. Strengthen our hearts to step out in solidarity with these suffering people and hold us all in the palm of your unfailing love. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who emptied himself of all but love in order to bring life to others. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Let us begin our worship by singing our first hymn together. It's, um, when you hear the name John Newton, many of you will think of his most famous hymn, um, Amazing Grace, but he composed a lot of hymns um, in his lifetime, and one of those is also quite well known, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. So would you like to stand, and we will sing together.
but a sort of a welcome into heaven. And uh, we're going to listen, listen to our Bible reading now, which Dinah's very kindly going to read for us. So, Dinah, over to you, love. Thank you. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Dinah. Don't hurt too, my friend. I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It really is good to be here this morning and to see so many of you. And without masks as well, I know some people are wearing masks and clearly that's good, but it is so nice to be able to see faces as well. Today, as we close our series on the Lord's Prayer, we are focusing on the words, For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for ever and ever. For me, these words remind us why we pray. We do it because the kingdom and the power and the glory all belong to God. It is that which gives us the confidence that our prayers are not in vain. The Lord's Prayer is a prayer for a community of disciples. That's why Jesus gave it to his disciples, so they would have a pattern, not a set form of words, but a pattern of things that they should pray to God about. And so we ask for our daily bread and the forgiveness of our sins and the deliverance from all sorts of trials and temptations that may befall us. And like a newborn foal, learning to walk, we learn the importance of getting back up again when we have fallen over. Sometimes, though, we need to do something different if we're going to get a different result. 
Some of us will know that the words, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, are not part of the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. They're not found in the Gospel of Luke or in the oldest manuscripts of Matthew's Gospel. Instead, it is thought that the ending of the Lord's Prayer, that's so familiar to us, was added by the early church. So why did the early church do this? Well, according to Luke's Gospel, Jesus taught his disciples what we now know as the Lord's Prayer on his way to Jerusalem, on his way to the cross. Appropriately, Jesus ended on a sombre note concerning our need for forgiveness and the avoidance of temptation. We see that in Luke 11, verse 4. But the early church had had so much more experience than Jesus and the disciples had at that point when he taught them the Lord's Prayer. They'd experienced not just the cross, but also the resurrection, the spread of the good news about Jesus, the spread that happened even under persecution and martyrdom. And therefore, I think they were compelled to include or to end with some words of triumph. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. It's, it's as if it never stops. It's the kingdom, it's the power, it's the glory, and it's forever and ever. So we have it today and we can pass it on to all our offspring as well. The end of the Lord's Prayer parallels the beginning. We pray, thy kingdom come, and we affirm at the end, thine is the kingdom. We pray, thy will be done, and we affirm the power of God in thine is the power. We pray, hallowed be thy name, and we affirm at the end, thine is the glory. When we pray for God's kingdom to come and state that God reigns over all, we admit that we need the help of God in our lives, that we're not self-sufficient, that we can't do it on our own. And I think sometimes we need to be told that. There's so many times when we just carry on in our own steam. And maybe someone just needs to tap us on the shoulder and say, I can help. We pray, for thine is the kingdom and the power. Because God has the power to accomplish God's will. And that power is available to us if we're willing to connect with God. I think I've said previously, I always think of it as we're born to be connected to God in the same way that maybe our toaster is born to be connected to the electricity. <laughs> we need to be connected in order to have the power of God in our lives. Ernest Beavers writes on Bible.org, about Herbert Jackson, who was a missionary. Jackson told how, as a new missionary, he was assigned a car that wouldn't start without a push. After pondering the problem, he devised a plan. He went to the school near his home. He got permission to take the children out of class. He wouldn't get that these days. And he had them push his car off from a standing start. As he made his rounds, he'd either park the car on the top of a hill or he'd leave the engine running. You may have read this yourselves, it's just on the Bible.org. 
And he lived with this problem for two years. Because after all, he found a solution and he wasn't too worried, evidently. Then there came a time through ill health that the Jackson family was, uh, in, was uh, that they needed to leave and a new missionary arrived. And Jackson was very proud to explain this workaround that he'd had, because this car was going to be passed on with the job. It's a company car I don't think I'd ever want myself. So as Jackson was explaining what it was that he was doing, the missionary lifted up the bonnet and had a look and pointed out the problem it was a loose cable. For Matt's benefit, it might have been the ignition cable or something. He tightened up the connection, stepped into the car, turned the key, and it fired up. It's like a Will It Run video on YouTube. For two years, Jackson had needlessly put up with all of this frustration and somehow it had become routine. It had become part of his life. The power w had been there all the time. Only a loose connection had kept Jackson from putting the power to work. We have to be connected to God in order for his power to flow through us. God's word prayer, worship and service, I think, are four ways in which we can connect with God. To be connected, though, we need to discover the wonder and the worthiness of God. And we're about to sing a song called He is Worthy, written by Andrew Peterson and Ben Shrive. When we're firmly connected to God, we have the power for living. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honour and glory? Is he worthy of this? He is. Let's sing. This is a song that we've sung quite a few times over, over the lockdown, um, either in a video form or, or whatever. This particular version is set, you know like in the old days you would have a cantor sing a line of a psalm and then you would either respond or repeat it. Um, we're going to put the words up. If you, uh, you can't put the words up without starting the song, can you? You'll find that the part that Mr. Peterson sings on the piano will be in plain type and then the part that we sing will be the response at the end which is in bold type and so it goes on for a bit and then it builds and it builds and it builds so that by the end of the song we're singing everything with him and the, the whole song is based on that wonderful image of when you enter heaven and going into the heavenly courts and the heavenly throne and just being amazed at the wonder of God and it tells the story of God as we go through. So I hope you enjoy it. If you want to stand, and the music group will help lead us. It's ever so simple, it starts very simple and then bit by bit we join in as we go through. I'm sure you'll get the hang of it. Just listen for the choir part. Is 
Please have a seat. Um, whether that's something new and whether you particularly like it or not, uh, try and take the basic point from it, which is simply this. But it, it, it's one of the major reasons where people fall short in their prayer life. So often we focus our prayer life on whether we think we're any good at it. But if we could just listen to those words and let them really mean something to us then actually we're focusing upon him and he is worthy and then we forget about whether we're any, we feel we're any good at praying or not. Our focus shifts to another place which is the most beautiful thing. And it would help so many people in, in, in grow in their prayer life if they could just make that leap. Forget about themselves and focus on him. So it's a good song. Thank you, David. He is worthy, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. And as Matt has just said, it gives us confidence to pray to a God 
who is the kingdom, who has the power, and who is worthy of the glory and our prayers forever and ever. The Apostle Paul believed that all people fall, fell short of the glory of God. Yet, because Jesus had died on the cross for all of us and sent his Holy Spirit to us, we have the opportunity for a new start in Christ. And all we have to do is to invite Christ into our lives and to ask him just to be with us. And we can do that in whichever way we find comfortable for ourselves, whether it's in the silence, whether it's through music, whether it's just being with our friends and feeling loved. Jesus is with us. We are part of God's kingdom. Paul writes in the first letter to the Thessalonians, our reading earlier today, read by Dinah, chapter 2, verses 11 to 12. As you know, we dealt with each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. God invites us this morning as well to be participants in God's glory. It would be nice to imagine that one day we could be walking along and there is Jesus in front of us healing the sick, raising the dead, preaching the kingdom. But at the moment, anyway, it's not like that. What it is like, of course, is that we meet or we know people who are being kind to others around the clock and putting strangers first. Workers in the NHS and the emergency services come immediately to mind, particularly over the last couple of years when we've lived under such difficult circumstances with COVID-19. Yet so many others are working, helping others too in the background. So many others that maybe we know but are not necessarily recognised that well because they're getting on with it behind the scenes. Jesus calls each one of us to be the body of Christ. His physical presence here in our communities. If we are to come to a living faith in God, then we need to become his hands, the hands and feet of Jesus. Do we really make space in our lives to form deep relationships? with those we meet? Or do we see people as just a group of individuals that we're really too busy to speak with? I think maybe the, the space that we've had over the last year or so has maybe enabled us to reach out to people in different ways. Maybe through a screen, but we may well have been able to reach out to more people in that way because somehow we don't have all the travelling to and fro and we don't have the busyness of getting from one place to another. But have we really taken advantage of that and what are we doing now going forward when hopefully we can see the sun on the horizon and maybe we're moving forward in a more positive way now? How much effort do we take to look below the surface of what's going on and welcome people from the margins of our society? Are we willing to listen to people's stories, to invest time and love in them so that they too 
can come to a living faith in Jesus. The Lord's Prayer closes by returning our focus to God just as it began. The more we focus on God, I think the more inspired we will become. This story appeared in the newsletter of Luther Place Memorial Church in Washington, D.C. It offers many forms of hospitality to people with desperate needs. One of the residents at an emergency shelter was the victim of an unprovoked attack just outside the church. Julie Goodenough, the coordinator of the shelter, recalled what happened after she rushed to the side of the wounded man. She's reported as saying, the next few minutes seemed like a lifetime. Much of it is a blur, but some moments stand out. The stranger, a black man I'd never seen before, helped to lay Ronnie down and calm him. The anguish and anger of the crowd surrounded us. It was the fear of death. The stranger was calming me and the people around us. He knelt beside me. He talked quietly of God's love and gave my heart strength. He led us all in the Lord's Prayer in the moments while we waited for the ambulance to arrive. I felt the Lord's presence with us on that sidewalk. Medical help arrived. Ronnie was taken away. And thankfully, he eventually recovered. The stranger and I walked away and embraced. And as we held each other, he whispered, just keep praying. Keep prayer in your heart. He walked around the corner and was gone. I wonder if this is just a simple, unfortunate accident that happened in that Washington street. Or maybe it's a window into the way that things are just beneath the surface of our day-to-day -day lives. I guess we've seen so much violence, whether it be in London or across the world in, in Afghanistan. But, but suddenly these, these disastrous events happen in the midst of ordinary life. And I think this story shows how the love of God suddenly bursts through and we have a window of the love of Jesus. It's that opportunity for God's kingdom to burst into the midst of the world's pain, its brokenness, its violence, its hunger. Perhaps importantly, breaks into somehow our inability to be able to forgive each other, no matter what the situation is. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, just like the man in the story who said, just keep praying, keep prayer in your heart. This is so God's kingdom, his power and his glory can be revealed to us forever and ever. As we conclude this series, it's my prayer that when you pray the Lord's Prayer, that you will hear and live it in a different way. In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Thank you, David. And uh, David is uh, currently training to be a spiritual director down at Sarum and has a real heart for prayer. And now he's uh, taking a new chapter in his life after work for many, many years. It's one of the things he really wants to try and help promote within the life of the church to help people develop their prayer life and to grow in their prayer life. So it's really appropriate that you've brought this to a conclusion today. And thank you so much, because I know it's something really deep on your heart. It's almost like when we come to the end of the Lord's Prayer, those wonderful words you said to us, keep praying. Don't just go, amen, great, I can go and do something else. Keep praying. I think it's what Paul means about prayer in our hearts. Yeah, lovely. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. During this time, what we've tried to do is, is find a way of putting all this into context then as a, a form of confession, because when we hear some words like those from David this morning, we can, and this, especially as I mentioned earlier about prayer, people become very self-conscious and they feel everybody else must have a most wonderful prayer life, but we haven't, or whatever, or they must be much doing it much more, or they must be doing better, or whatever. And that isn't how God sees it. He wants to build us up, particularly in prayer. So let's just take a moment to bring all our own thoughts and uh, feelings about our prayer life, its joys and its worries, its concerns, whether it's really healthy for us at the moment or whether it's rather dry or even if it's not something we've been involved with for, for a long time. We can all come and we can share our confession. So Lord, forgive us when we are charging through this life and fail to see you and your call upon our lives. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Thank you that even so, you continue to be faithful and you pour out your word and your grace on our lives each and every day. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. And Lord, help us to afresh our, de our delight and our wonder in who you are. You truly are. King of kings and Lord of lords, eternal Father, Spirit, Word. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn to him. Have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Howard. Just before Ruth leads us in our prayers for the wider community, I'm, with you telling stories, David, I'm reminded of a wonderful story by a gentleman called Mike Iaconelli, who used to be a big speaker at a Christian festival called Greenbelt. And he would tell a whole story that would go on for an hour, all right, in a big tent, and he'd have a thousand people before him. He was a great storyteller, a bit like Ronnie Corbett. And he would build it up and build it up and build it up. But basically the point was, if Mike Iaconelli prayed for um, two minutes, then actually the whole of heaven got pizza. And I think sometimes <laughs> we maybe feel the same. When you hear the stories of pe people praying for hours and all the rest of it, isn't that wonderful that the whole of heaven gets pizza if any one of you prays for two minutes? I think that's the idea. Ruth, hand over to you. Lord, we are glad to be together here in your presence. We've been kept apart for so long, over so many months. You've told us that where a few are gathered in your name, there you are. Well, here we are. We look around at your wonderful world, which is in such disarray. 
where for so long people's eyes have been taken away from your guiding light, your truth, distracted by short-term goals, not by matters enduring. We pray that you will help us see that after the hard times we've come through, it's time for us to start again, to have open hearts and minds, to work for the good of all. Enable us, we pray, to move forward as an outward-looking and caring church community, looking always towards a fulfilling and hopeful future. We pray for your kingdom on earth, not a kingdom of rules and regulations, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, for a rule of life as you would have it, governed by love, where there is fairness, awareness, justice, forgiveness, and above all, peace. In a moment of quietness, please allow us to put before you and to pray for the people of Afghanistan, the refugees, and those left behind. The people of Yemen, the forgotten war and the suffering. The people of Haiti in the aftermath of a devastating earthquake. The victims of Hurricane Ida in the United States rebuilding lives. The brewing famine conditions in Africa and especially this week, commemoration of September the 11th, 2001, and the global fallout of that event. We ask for your succor for all those in need and for those trying to bring relief. And pray for your help so that we can be strong enough to lead by example in speaking up for the oppressed. Help each one of us work actively for your kingdom. We pray for your power, for the power of your spirit to be present in our lives to direct us so that we reflect your will and live a right life. Help us to be witnesses to the fruitful life that embracing this power can bring. We are your hands and feet, so change must come through us. We pray for the strength to work towards transformation of ourselves and those around us. And Lord, we pray for the glory, not the vainglory of earthly possessions and status, but the glory of the fulfillment of your kingdom on earth, where we live at peace with our world and at peace with one another. Earthbound glory withers and dies but the glory of living in and with you lasts forever. We pray for your help to reflect this glory in our daily lives, in all that we say and do. And we thank you that you have revealed the way. And we pray for your help to be faithful stewards of your world. We ask this all in your precious name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.
And so we come to the celebration of the Eucharist. I always think the wonderful thing about, one of the many wonderful things about the Eucharist is that it is what we do until he comes again. So as we've preached, as David has preached on uh, the power, yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, uh, we continue to take the Eucharist as a symbol of his kingdom, his power and his glory until he comes again. My brothers and sisters, the Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is always good to give you thanks, God our Creator, loving and faithful, holy and strong. You have made us and the whole universe and filled your world with life. You sent your Son to live among us, Jesus our Saviour, as Mary's child. He suffered on the cross. He died to save us from our sin, and he was raised by you in glory from the dead. You send your Holy Spirit to bring new life into the world and clothe us with love from on high. And so we join the angels to celebrate and say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Father, on the night before Jesus died, he shared a meal with his friends. He took the bread and thanked you. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he thanked you and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is of God's unfailing love. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus Christ has died. Jesus Christ is risen. Jesus Christ will come again. Father, as we bring this bread and wine and remember Jesus' death and resurrection, send your Holy Spirit that we who share these gifts may be fed by Christ's body. Pour your Spirit on all people, that we may love one another, work for the healing of the earth, and share the good news of Jesus as we wait for his coming in glory. So let's take a moment to be still, and maybe with a particular emphasis and reflection before we say these famous and well-known words, let's maybe take a longer pause than normally as we prepare to say the Lord's Prayer. And so with deep faith and deep conviction, we say the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. So draw near with faith. Uh, just, just to let you know, the, we, the way we've uh, been offering the Eucharist of late is uh, we intinct it with a little drop of wine from the chalice and put that onto a wafer so that, in a sense, you have the sense of the bread and the wine.
That's all right, don't worry, I'll keep going. All right? So, um, we're just going to go to our hymns and songs for this week. Um, as we have done throughout this time, we'll put up a, a number of uh, hymns and songs throughout the week for you. Um, one we didn't play at the beginning of the service, and you might like if you, if you uh, are a visual person, is uh, Matt Redman did a, a song called Coming Back to the Heart of Worship. At the very height of his popularity, when he was traveling the world on big stages and big audiences, he peeled it all back and just came back to his own guitar and a very simple song, Coming Back to the Heart of Worship, which um, sort of echoes very much what David was talking about today. And uh, this particular version we, we'll put up during the week on the, on the Facebook channel we'll, um, has an artist painting um, what that's like um, while he's actually singing the song. It's, it's very beautiful um, how they do that. And then all the other different hymns and songs that we, we sing. But uh, as, as by contrast, at the very end of the service, after our friends have left us um, on, uh, on, online, um, there's going to be, I, I want you to have a bit, of a, a bit of a funny, it's been an important service, but I want you to have a, prayer can have laughter in it. Did you know that? Have you ever laughed in prayer? I hope so. Because prayer should give you life and energy, and there's a wonderful version, you may have seen it before, I don't know, called The Silent Monk Sing the Hallelujah Chorus. Have you ever seen that? Ro um, Romany has. Well, if you haven't, I hope it will make you laugh. Because your prayer, especially for those of you who feel you're not very, you know, particularly good at singing, it hopefully will make you smile, if nothing else. So for those joining us online, please have a look at that as well. We'll post that during the week. Next one, please, George. Um, we keep going with um, the story of prayer. If, you, if, if, if you're wanting to revive and renew your prayer life, then I can only encourage you to look at the daily blogs. Um, they've all been recorded as well as being up every day. And I give thanks for the group of people who are putting these up every day. Um, and we've continued to look at the work of Philip Yancey. Um, and uh, really insightful and helpful. And we'll be looking at some of the big questions that he raises um, in the coming four weeks as we lead up to um, harvest together. Next one, please, George. The prayer diary has gone out for this month, and if that's something that you normally get or you haven't received a copy and you'd like a copy, please get in touch with Kirsty or George, and they'll make sure that you get a copy, either if you're joining us online or physically as well. Next one, please. We've had a, a home communion, uh, home communion, a midweek communion service in Kongsbury for some years. Um, but one of the things that's happened out of, um, as we're starting to emerge out of lockdown, is um, the desire that, that we, we see whether there would be a community that would like to join us for communion midweek here in Banwell. So we're going to be starting that this Tuesday um, at uh, just after nine o'clock. Um, give me a chance to get over from Kongsbury. But... Um, What's really great is somebody's very kindly offered to set up communion and even provide coffee afterwards. So if you'd like to come along for a very simple um, little service, but to find that regular rhythm and pattern to your prayer and receive communion during the week, it may be that you come occasionally, it may be that you come every week, um, but it will be there every Tuesday if you'd like to join us beginning this Tuesday here in Banwell. Next one, please. And the Rule of Life group um, will start up again, and as will many of the home groups as we start to go into October. Um, the Rule of Life group starts on the 15th of September. And you might say, well, I've not been part of it before. What is this Rule of Life group? It's people who are trying to live by a rhythm of prayer. It's not for some sort of spiritual elite or people who are ultra, you know, Christians, or been Christians for many years. It can be from the person who's just starting out in faith to wherever they are in their journey, but who are seeking to find and deepen a rhythm of life um, to, their, to their way of being. And if that's something that speaks to you, then there's a group, it meets online um, each week, and uh, you can get details from Kirsty or George. Next one, please. And then, as I mentioned a moment ago, many of the other groups and study groups and home groups are gonna start up in October, and 
one of the things I think very quite strongly within myself is that as we look to the future, personal discipleship um, will be the, the key. The fact that people are praying, the fact that people do pick up their Bibles, whether on a, a, a phone or in a physical Bible, and they take their time just to read it for a few minutes each day. They do receive communion. They do these acts of kindness and worship and fellowship. It will be by personal discipleship that we will grow out of all that we've been through. So it's great that we've got all these groups starting up, so look out for details of those. Next one, please. Yep. Um, we'll do the song, if that's okay. So we're going to close our worship today with a wonderful Charles Wesley hymn, um, And Can It Be That I Should Gain. Would you like to stand and we'll sing our final hymn together?
from that today. Over to you, Howard. So we come to the final blessing. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May he always look kindly upon us and give us his peace. So may the blessing of God Almighty, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name, name of, of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. I think as we make our way out, you're going to have a chuckle. It's the silent monks. <laughs> we just wave goodbye to everyone who uh, is joining us online. So wave Oh, okay. Is that okay? Yeah, do you want, um, yeah, okay, yeah. Oh, can we put it up straight afterwards, or? It or not? Be in the same oh, okay. And we can't run people, so we've got to go back and watch it. Okay, right. I don't know, I don't know what quite was happening. Yeah.